Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 1050 of the Juicebox podcast. Today, I'll be speaking with Kristen. She's the mother of a child with type 1 diabetes. I'm going to talk about a number of different things here. I think Arden comes up in this episode. I think I call her doing it or text her or something. And uh, what else happens? Oh, Kristen's divorced. We talk about that with the impact of diabetes management and uh, a lot more. Honestly, I don't know what to call this one. So the title is probably not going to make any sense. While you're listening, please remember that nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your healthcare plan or becoming bold with insulin. If you'd like to save 40% off of your entire order at CozyEarth.com, you can go get yourself sheets, towels, and clothing and save that 40% with the offer code JUICEBOX at checkout. You can also get a free year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first order of AG1 at my link, drinkag1.com slash juicebox. The podcast is sponsored today by BetterHelp. BetterHelp is the world's largest therapy service and is 100% online. With BetterHelp, you can tap into a network of over 25,000 licensed and experienced therapists who can help you with a wide range of issues. BetterHelp.com forward slash juice box. To get started, you just answer a few questions about your needs and preferences in therapy. That way, BetterHelp can match you with the right therapist from their network. And when you use my link, you'll save 10% on your first month of therapy. You can message your therapist at any time and schedule live sessions when it's convenient for you. Talk to them however you feel comfortable, text, chat, phone, or video call. If your therapist isn't the right fit, for any reason at all, you can switch to a new therapist at no additional charge. And the best part for me is that with BetterHelp, you get the same professionalism and quality you expect from in-office therapy, but with a therapist who is custom-picked for you. And you're going to get more scheduling flexibility and a more affordable price. BetterHelp.com forward slash juice box. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P.com forward slash juice box. My name is Kristen. I am a caretaker for Ray, an eight-year-old uh, type 1 diabetic. Okay. Ray is eight. How old was he when he was diagnosed? She, she. was... Yeah, yeah, it's a R E Y like the Star Wars girl. R E oh, like Ray. That's yeah, beautiful. Like That's Ray. Beautiful, beautiful like that. I love that. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Um yeah, okay. So different. she I'm sorry, so she was how old? Uh she was six. So it was we're about at our two year in May. Two years. Okay. How did it present? Yeah, so she had, had COVID in April of twenty twenty one. And then a couple weeks later, started throwing up. And it was so funny because her sister had just had a stomach bug. Um, so we really just thought, no big deal. And then after a couple days, her dad took her to the ER because he said she seemed really lethargic all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. So I don't know quite what that looked like. But uh, yeah, then she went to the ER. They gave her fluids and did the normal thing where they say, okay, this is the flu. Just go on home. And then right then she started uh, hallucinating. And then they said, never mind, let's keep her here a few more seconds. Uh, and then somebody finally thought to check her blood sugar, which I think was, you know, close to 700. And then it all became clear. Wow. They got to the blood sugar that quickly. Yeah, well, you know, it had been, I think it had been four or five hours of kind of like, okay, oh. let's give fluids and monitor. And, and she seemed so much better. So it did take some time. Um, and then not long after, you know, the CDC came out with that report that said, COVID leads to type one. So check for it. So I was really grateful thinking, you know, maybe next time they wouldn't have to be like super far into DK before it was, you know, discovered. If someone came in post COVID, they would just check someone, blood sugar right away. Yeah. Someone would think to look. Yeah. Okay. So that's a couple of years ago already. Right. How long was she in the hospital for? About four days. Four days. Did that seem long to you or did that seem about right? 
you know, it, it, it was all kind of a, a fever dream. You know, I didn't sleep at all the first two nights um, because it was just so scary. The first night she was so just still really hallucinating and, and kind of terrified and miserable. And then uh, and they kind of told me, you know, you're going to be here for a long time. Eventually we'll transfer you to another hospital where you can you know, go to diabetes school, but we got to stabilize. It could be a week here. So they were really telling me I had it in my head, like, okay, we're going to be here for weeks. So in some senses it, it seemed quick, but in other senses, you know, I've, I've never been admitted at the ER before. We always just go in and they say, okay, go home. Right. So in, in, uh, in that sense, it just felt really surreal to be in a hospital for so many days. And they did transfer us, but it was really just about two, two and a half days. And then she was out of ICU and then, uh, then they had beds, at the local children's hospitals. They mm. moved us over there to like go to diabetes school. And then we were there for, I think just two nights and then came home. No contacts for diabetes at all in your family or anything like that. Yeah. So her, uh, dad's sister is type one oh. and I, it just never occurred to me. I don't think I understood that there could be some genetic links and so I, I just didn't even think about that. And and I was kind of curious if if he, if her dad thought about that when he took her in. Kristen, you broke up. I'm sorry. Sooner. You, Kristen, I'm um, sorry. I'm sorry. You broke up. You were wondering if. And so I think we're. I'm not clear on this. So are you and her father not together? That's right. We're, oh, yeah, okay. we're divorced. So you you said you wondered if that was in his mind when when he went to the hospital, but you don't know. Yeah, I don't know, and I have to guess no, just because I think he would have said somebody check her blood sugar sooner if he had that in his mind at all. But yeah, you know, the longer I do this, I used to be kind of more shocked by that. Like, yeah, like why would somebody not think of that? But then the longer I do it, I just think that that's not how it works. You know, we were talking to my son recently and you know arden's had diabetes since she was two right so for you know almost like two full decades they lived together with diabetes and my son said something the other day and i was like that's not how that works and he goes no and i'm like you don't know that and he goes no i guess i don't and i Hmm. and, and so extrapolating that forward like trying to put my son in a situation 15 years from now and he's in the ER with a baby going, I don't know what's wrong with this baby. Like, I don't know if he would think to say, you know, my sister has type one diabetes and right. You know yeah. I mean? It's strangely not top of mind. And I feel like I, t- everywhere I go, I, I tell people like, Hey, did you know this is how she was diagnosed? Did you know that most type ones are diagnosed in adulthood now? Did you know? Because I just feel so traumatized by that experience. And I just think, how do we stop diagnosing in DKA? It is a horrible experience yeah. and how nice it would be to just routinely check it or have it more top of mind. But you know, it's just one of those things. It's rare enough that people don't think of it. Right. You know, the other side of that is, and it's funny you're bringing, it's really ironic that you're bringing this up because right before we jumped on, I was running through my messages. There's this message from this person who's like, you know, I'm doing a project for my journalism class and my father has type one diabetes and, People don't understand it enough. And I was wondering if and blah, 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 and they asked the question. My thought was, well, you don't want me involved in this because what I'm going to say to you is I think it's completely reasonable that people don't understand type 1 diabetes. And then <laughs> and what's and what's the alternative? Like, what do we do? We, like, take a week out of everyone's life and sit them down and explain everything in the world that could possibly go wrong to them because yeah. that sounds like that would be overwhelming. And it, it's... But I take everyone's point when they're like, you know, it shouldn't get to this point and it would be so easy for doctors to do a finger stick check when there are certain um, symptoms arise. And I, I kind of – that's why I think it's more on the medical side. Like you're not just going to randomly expect everyone to understand. But if – at least no, if the doctors yeah, did. No, you're right you know. because there's so many autoimmune disorders that I have so little information about and it, it does seem like – um, it must be frustrating to, you know, to somebody else who doesn't understand like G tube and, you know, feeding tubes and stuff like that. And I just don't, I think the real, the frustration comes in, you're right, when medical folks seem to not get it, which I think we all run into, I see it, you know, every day on the Facebook page, people mm-hmm. run into medical staff that don't quite get it, mm-hmm. which is very frustrating and or folks who kind of assume they get it, you know, and I, so I think, you know, maybe is it just like we need to respect each other more to understand that, you know, 
whatever you're going through, you're the expert of that. And yeah, I mean, I think doctors should know. We had a dentist just tell us we should be able to manage her type one with medication and we should stop giving her treatments for lows. <laughs> really? Yeah. A, a physician told you that? Yeah, her dentist at the last appointment. There you go. I was like, yeah, I, th- I think that's, I think you're thinking of type two. And she was like, so you're telling me that her doctor wants her to have sugar? And I was like, look, let's just move on here. Okay. Yeah. I, I understand. I'm going to try to avoid lows for you. All right. But that's, I'm not going to get to a low and say, you know what? Your doctor doesn't want you to have sugar. Let's, let's do something else. Sweet. sweet. Yeah. Uh, in, in lieu of a, uh, of, of a cavity, why don't we just drop dead right now instead? Uh, yeah, that'd be <laughs> exactly. great. Cause I don't want you to have a cavity. Well, you know, right, cause that's expensive for me. Yeah. <laughs> My God. Insurance for dentistry is terrible. Uh, I was sitting in a, in an infusion center recently getting an iron infusion, right? And I'm sitting there and I've been there a number of times. I now have what I would loosely call a relationship with one of the nurses. And she just says like, what do you do for a living? And I was like, oh, I make a podcast. And that's already a leap. People are just like, what now? You know, and then you're like, well, I I make a podcast. And, and then they go, well, I don't understand. How is that a job? (laughs) I said, well, podcast reaches a lot of people and then advertisers buy ads. And so I make a podcast and, and, and she, she's coming online. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then she goes, um, what's it about? And I said, Di- <laughs> diabetes. And she goes, do you have diabetes? And I went, no, <laughs> and I was like, but and then I explained that whole other thing. And she had met Arden once. She's like, Oh, that little girl. And I'm like, yes, yeah, so she's not little anymore. Going through this whole thing. Anyway, this leads into her telling me about her experience with diabetes in the hospital. And Hmm. all the people that she saw and what she tells people. And I want to tell you that about 87% of what she said wasn't accurate. Hey, guys, just jumping in to remind you that one of our sponsors, BetterHelp, is offering 10% off your first month of therapy when you use my link, betterhelp.com forward slash juice box. That's betterhelp.com forward slash juice box. BetterHelp is the world's largest therapy service. It is 100% online, boasts over 25,000 licensed and experienced therapists, and you can talk to them however you want, text, chat, phone, or on video. You can actually message your therapist at any time and schedule live sessions when it's convenient for you. BetterHelp.com forward slash juice box. Save 10% on your first month. Oh, wow. And so I was just sitting there like making a decision. I had a, like a, you know, a needle in my arm. <laughs> And I'm sitting, I'm like, and I'm, I'm going to be there for the next hour. And I just nodded through. I was like, uh huh, uh huh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, uh huh. Thank you. And then I, she said one thing that was so egregious that I turned her on it. And then I was like, what am I going to do? Like, she's running around. By the way, I'm the only person there, lucky enough not to have cancer in an infusion center, you know. And right. so she's running around doing her job. And what am I going to like pull her aside and go, hey, listen, you fundamentally don't understand any of the things that you just said. Like, wh- what would she have done <laughs> next? You know, uh, so. I mean, you could give her some episode numbers. I, well, I told her about the podcast and I told her how to listen to it. <laughs> I thought maybe she'll figure something out. She had worked in a hospital and she knew enough. Right. She knew enough to deal with it the way hospitals deal with it when you're admitted, but you're not admitted for your diabetes, I guess, is the that's is, right. Is what she had. that's right. Yeah. But she thought she understood it 100%. Yeah. And I think that's just the, that's really the tricky part is just, and that, I I don't know. I I have a little bit less empathy for that. I think I understand that folks in medical settings have to just know so much information, but it does feel to me, especially when it comes to chronic illness, that there, there could definitely stand to be a crash course or two about like, okay, how do you deal with this? You know, when somebody's here, just like you said, I guess my only thought on that is that and this is generally how I feel with endos it's like they have one job and then as parents and caregivers or type ones ourselves we have a different job yeah and so we're gonna fundamentally disagree and that's not necessarily because we disagree does that make sense it's because we just have different roles and if you're a you know medical professional your job is public health which means you know the best possible advice that's going to work for the largest group of people keeping things like compliance in mind. Yeah. And that's just going to be different advice than you would give your own child. I'm sure even an endo would say that. Oh no, absolutely. I, your, your goals and their goals are, are different. You would think they're yeah. the same, but if you stop and really consider it, 
They're not. Right. You're you're talking about day to day, minute to minute care, and they're like, mm-hmm. "Look, you're going to be here for 48 hours. I don't want you having a seizure while you're here, so we're going to keep your blood sugar at 200." Like that's right. Just, and they're yeah. they're talking about advice that's going to work for every diabetic that comes in. And I always just say, like, look, you're you're doing a great job for diabetics, but I, you know, I care in a broader sense about diabetic people, but in in a specific sense, I care about one diabetic, and that's my daughter. Mm. Yeah, and we're not going to let you do that today. So yeah, so you stick yeah. up, you, and it's not even stick up for yourself. You just sort of you educate in the moment for that moment. Like you're not trying right. to change their mind forever and ever. You're just trying to get you through that situation. And maybe that information sticks with the nurse or the physician or whatever. And they carried along to the next one, which is my expectation. And, you know, Jenny always points out to me, adult endos overwhelmingly see type two patients and not type one patients. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So yep. If you have a child with type one, then you get this. It's a different experience. Like you go into a children's hospital, you know, generally speaking, and everything's very, I don't know how to put it. Like, it's nice. It's like you're ordering off the menu. You know what I mean? Like the (laughs) the place is really clean and they tell you everything you need to know and you're having an experience. And Mm -hmm. like, and when you get to an adult end though, it's like, Hey, hi, what do you need? Insulin here, get out. (laughs) Yeah. 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 It's different. And, and, uh, it kind of relates to what you said is, you know, advocating in the moment for that moment and not trying to change the big picture. I think that is exactly perfect advice to deal with school nurses, too. Um, I, you know, I was just talking about this with somebody else, but I, I feel like with school nurses, it can feel like you need to get on the same page in a in a broader sense. And you really just don't. Mm-hmm. You really just have to say, OK, how can we get this need met in this moment? How do we make it so that, you know, I can call the shots in this particular moment and then we can move on? But I think it can cause a lot of problems for families when they're trying to make sure you guys agree about type one management. And that just might not happen. Yeah. Hey, listen, I'm sorry to do this in the middle of this, but I'm going to call Arden because she's wearing a new CGM. And I don't know if the blood sugar I'm seeing is of a grand concern or not accurate. So I apologize. Hold on one second. I'm not going to stop the recording. So just give me a second. Okay. haven't done this in a while (laughs) on the podcast i mean (laughs) she just texted me the word stop so i'm assuming she's okay oh my god that's so funny uh all right (laughs) what does stop mean stop calling because i got this stop calling leave me alone i'm trying to blah 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 she's probably running around or something like that it's just it's a new sensor and i sent her a text this morning and I said, hey, can you please calibrate this? Um, uh-huh. And then there's a setting she has to f- like kind of flip a switch and loop that she hasn't s- flipped yet. And um, now she's made a bolus, a big, she had a meal, very uh-huh. obviously, about 55 minutes ago. And at the moment, the CGM is indicating a 53 blood sugar with an arrow straight down. I see. It just switched over now to 48. So I'm going to guess that her blood sugar is not really 48. And it's clearly stopping. Like, so she knows the food's hitting her, so she's not worried. And uh, I mean, I've done what I can do. When it only drops four like that, that's when I kind of sigh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's like it's just a brand. It's a brand new sensor, so I don't know if it's like settled in well or you know whatever. So, yeah. and I can never, well, not never, but the process of getting her to test around a new sensor is she's she doesn't she hates it. She won't do it. Yeah. Well, she does it, but I have to like cajole her sometimes. Yeah. So like, I'm like, hey, let's just check. You know, it's like, Mm -hmm. it's a couple hours old. Like, let's just be sure. Um, Anyway. Well, that was fun. (laughs) (laughs) I love the one word text. My daughter will just text me one word help sometimes. (laughs) It drives me nuts. I'm like, look, there are lots of things that that could mean. And that's very stressful for me. It could mean. You know, you're feeling low. It can mean there's a shooter in the hallway. God forbid. Please text me something more descriptive than the word help. Mommy, Usually it means she wants to come home. <laughs> Mommy, are you seeing the meteors falling out of the sky too? <laughs> <laughs> right. Down. Please use adjectives. Yeah. Down to, I can't think of the word I need for. And, exactly. Yeah, yeah. No. Very helpful. Well, Arden's, yeah, my nerves can't take that word. 
Arden's direct. She must be, I'm guessing, based on the time of day, she's rushing around to get to a class. Like she's, I think I she's in her dorm room getting ready to leave. And I so she, she doesn't have the time to give away to me and my concerns for her safety. So anyway, we'll keep an eye on that as it goes because, you know, whatever. All right. So anyway, so yes, there's diabetes in the family, but no, nobody was thinking about it. You're right. divorced. And so am I to take from that? There's not a ton of uh, communication or is the communication good? Uh, no. And maybe, yeah, it's okay. I would say that we kind of, the way that we manage it is that we just do things separately. So like even on her pump, we have separate profiles and she kind of knows, okay, I just got to mom's. I got to switch over to the mom profile. And I think in the beginning, we really tried to, to kind of communicate and collaborate and it just, we just can't do it. We can't do it. Yeah, we just keep things pretty separate, and and that makes it okay. I think it took us a couple years post-diagnosis to kind of chill out about it and not think, okay, when she goes to the other house, something terrible is going to happen. We kind of settle and know that everyone's doing their best. Um, her A1C is fine. She's doing fine. So, yeah, I think that's about as good as it gets for us. So there's two management styles? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Gee, Kristen. <laughs> I think I heard a lot in that. Oh, yeah, but okay. Um, so it's a little higher and not as focused at one house and at the other, you're a little more on top of things. Is that fair enough? Yeah, I mean, I think that's about how it feels. And I I will say that I could go into Clarity, for example, and, and try to measure and say, hey, look, on these days of the week, is she really more in range? Um, I'm not going to go down that path. I don't feel like it's good for anybody. Mm -hmm. But my guess is you would see a, a better time and range. You know, I have my moments. She was high last night. Um, and I didn't truly know why overnight. And that that's unusual. Um, so I, I have times, you know, a sense or a, um, what are those called? A set, uh, infusion site seems to fail or something. And I have a she goes up high, but sure. I want to say for the most part, I feel like I know what I'm doing. Fat pizza is still hard for me, but it's getting way better. Mm. But I feel like everything else, I can do juice, I can do cupcakes, I can do cereal, like all that good to go. And it, I think the sense I get from the other house, at least in the beginning, is that like they don't mind if blood sugar is up high as long as it comes back down within three hours. And that's kind of what they were told. And as far as I can tell, they follow the endo advice kind of perfectly. Yeah. And, and you know, that is kind of the endo advice that that's okay. And I don't, that to me is not a, we missed, you know what I mean? If we're up over 200, for, that's not like fine with me. <laughs> mm. So would you say that it's not apathy, right? Like they're doing, they're doing yeah. what they're supposed to be doing. It's just not what you would be hoping. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And I think I had to kind of come to that place in the beginning where it was like, look, it's not like they're not giving her insulin. They're troubleshooting when she's high um, and trying to do something about it. They're up at night. And I think they both, uh, her uh, step stepmom, they're, I don't think they're married, but they're, anyway, she lives with them and has for years. They are doing their best. And I feel confident about that. And I say that with about 86% confidence. <laughs> huh, that's not bad at all. Yeah, that's not bad. So I'll take it. Eighty six percent from a person who just said, "I don't think they're married," which <laughs> so I would, indi <laughs> would indicate you don't have a ton of insight. <laughs> I don't you know? It's not my business. Of course, of but course. I, I think of her as a step parent. She does all the parenty stuff, and cool. um, you know, well, very nice. Uh, I mean, yeah. I, I, can you talk a little bit about what that's like in the beginning, though? When, like, not now, but mm -hmm. when. when you're doing a thing, I guess, five days a week, and then on two days or however you're broken up, th then it just yeah. changes. Does it make you mental? Are you like, oh, my God, how did it hit you and how did you get through it? Yeah, no, it was definitely really challenging. Um, and I, I sound chill about it now, but I wasn't. And I often am not. I mean, it comes up still for sure, because I think as a parent of a kid who has higher needs, I my uh, the way my trauma from the hospital has manifested is in hypervigilance. And I have, that's been a light switch that's turned on for me that is a first time thing. Prior to this, I was a very 
laid back parent to a fault. You know, we'd get places and I'd be like, oh, God, we didn't need a meal. That's so funny, you know, or, you know, <laughs> we get to school without backpacks. That was just kind of normal. And um, that is not how I am anymore, you know, by necessity. And so it's very difficult when she's not here. I would say my anxiety is pretty high every night she's not here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just so hard not being able to control your kid's well-being as a parent, period, any time, but especially when there's something that does need so much input and then um, you're physically not in the same house. That's really challenging. I think early on there was a lot more, I think the kind of broad, crude story we kind of told about our management styles was that she was always low at my house and she was always high at their house. Um, And I don't think either of those things were ever true, but that was kind of the story. So then there was like extra anxiety every time she did go low here because I felt like I was like proving that story correct and it was very stressful for me. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I would hear about it and that was really hard. Um, I didn't know in the beginning how things would turn out. And I think now that we've had enough time, I can see, you know, overall, and you know maybe 69 percent in range over there maybe 70 and that's you know she's more in range here so it evens out yeah. so yeah can i ask then like in this situation like just now with arden which by the way do you think people are listening going like is arden alive could someone fill me in <laughs> i'll tell you in a second don't worry um so but but in a situation like this if you were looking at like a dropping arrow and it was frightening uh-huh. Do you have the ability to call the house and say, hi, is someone seeing this? Or is that not something you guys have? No, we don't have that. And you know what? I don't I don't look. I turn off all my alarms and I don't wear my watch because otherwise I can't sleep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, no. Well that oh, Kristen, yeah. that's what I'm that's the thing I'm imagining. Like right now, if mm-hmm. I wasn't able to reach out to somebody, like what would I do with the uh-huh. with the feeling? You know what I mean? I guess yeah, you, yeah. you call a therapist. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it's hard for sure. I have a lot of misplaced hypervigilance and I think it lands on other stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, is your dining but, uh, room very clean <laughs> or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I I uh I started a grad school program and I really do think that, you know, I think as far as I'm still I'm still uh the jury's still out on if me going to grad school uh, is a misplaced <laughs> way to spend my anxiety dollars, but I, I think it's okay. You know, it's me pouring into something that I can like research and learn more about and really do something productive uh, because I'm going to school to become a diabetes social worker. Mm-hmm. So it's it's a way for me to channel all of that like energy. Yeah, into the the stuff that I can control when I know ultimately I have to just trust um because calling yeah calling i did that once or twice it doesn't it doesn't uh end well it doesn't go well it, it turns into the exact reason you're divorced <laughs> yeah it's yeah. just it just doesn't promote um a, a, yeah it, it doesn't do what i intended it to do i'll just say that <laughs> it doesn't do what i intend <laughs> now in fa- i want to be fair in fairness do you get on the phone and you're like you guys are killing her you're not paying attention or is it high does it just no it's a mistrust even if you're like hi i just saw that blood sugar's falling really quickly and i was concerned and wanted to make sure that that just goes the wrong way yeah i think every once in a while i have texted but yeah i think in general we try to keep contact really specific to logistics and and anytime there's other stuff i would say i get more feedback than i give and how, how old are you? It's guys? really what's that? How old are you? Uh, 37. Is your husband or, or your ex husband a similar age? Yes. How long were you together for? Uh, about seven, eight years, did something meet, like that. Did you meet when you were very young? Um, uh, we were in college, oh, so kind okay. of average that. time. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> okay. I'm just trying to like pick You're You're doing such a lovely job of like talking around it being, you know. You're doing a good job of explaining your situation. It's just a couple <laughs> little details I don't have. Okay, so we understand how difficult that is, and you focused it into something else. And right. You, you, because I'm imagining in those gaps of time, they probably just feel like time is paused, right? Like they're like the girls are gone, and then yeah. you're just sitting there, like paused, waiting for your turn again. 
hoping they come yeah, back okay? It, yeah, it's it was uh and it is. It's still hard. You know, I kept thinking after a couple of years I'll get used to them not being here. And, and I really haven't um and still find it challenging, but I do think part of it is that experience I had in the hospital which really just rewired my brain. Um and I found like, you know, in the couple of months up to a year after I really just felt so spaced out. Christian, you're breaking up fully remote at work, but I would get a call from the nurse and it was like, my brain was electric. I could think of a million things at once. I knew every, you know, how many carbs was in each part of her lunch. And I could do any of that math. And I knew where all the supplies were and where the insurance stood. And so it was like, all of my sharpness was like retained for this one thing that was so anxiety inducing. And then everything else just felt like soup. And it's, it's not unlike that now. It's just much less extreme. Did you go to therapy? Is that how you got to this point? I have always been in therapy. Okay. But yeah, I did specifically call someone and say to Kristen. To, um, Kristen, I'm so yeah. sorry. You broke up. I'm I'm getting like an unstable internet connection message from your side. So I'm not sure oh, shoot. Okay. what happened. Um, you've always been in therapy. You called someone. You called someone and what? Yeah, I called somebody and specifically said I could use some help with this and I don't want to talk about my feelings. I just really need someone to help me with the here and now kind of logistics of balancing this stuff. So in that com- in those conversations, what what was valuable for you? Oh gosh, what a good question. I don't I don't really know. I think a sounding board. I think, you know, you need connection to what's real. I feel like, you know, you do such a good job at that. There's a lot of, because our kids kind of are like, it's, it's so hard to explain diabetes, right? Because it's like, listen, they're fine. They just could die. And like, those things are both true at the same time. And so you have to kind of balance between like, what's real and that. So like, yeah, your kid is, has a 50 blood sugar. That sucks. But they're not actually close to death, right? Like, who kind of, how do you kind of ground yourself in that reality that they, that if things keep going badly, they could die, but they probably won't keep going badly Mm -hmm. um, because they're going to eat something. Mm. Yeah, because people don't understand, they don't have context for what you're saying. And, And it really is true. Like, I've, listen, I've tried many times to explain it to somebody where I didn't sound crazy. That was always my, mm-hmm. I was like, can I get this out without me sounding like I'm like being like over the top, you know? Right. Um, hey, right. Her, if her blood sugar is falling and we don't do anything, it's going to end very poorly. But if we right. do something, it'll likely be fine. But we want to be vigilant about it and pay attention until we know. Speaking of vigilance, Arden's blood sugar is 60 now. Excuse me, six, oh. 60 now. And obviously her food hit her a few minutes later than she expected for it to. It's like a hundred percent what's happening here. She made a nice. Oh, good. Yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. glad it's not still in the fifties. Yeah. So I'm gonna guess from what I'm seeing on the Dexcom. Oh, there it is, seventy two. Yeah, Yay. this is it. So that's why I got the stop email because what stop <laughs> means is it's interesting, right? Because odd how this conversation is coming together, but it's not much different than you calling your ex because. I pinged, right. I pinged her for a very good reason. Like, no one would say that what I did wasn't reasonable. Right. But, but in her world, this is already handled. Like, I, right. I did a thing. I ate. This is going to be fine. I know the CGM looks a little low right now, but I feel fine. So maybe she was never really, you know, like, you know, like she's probably higher. Like, if we would have tested at 49, she might have already been 60 or whatever. And um, right. And now she's feeling judged and questioned. Right. Right. And you're taking her out of her flow of her day and what she's doing. But none of that changes what it's like to be on this side of it. Right. And the two never even like, you know, we're sitting here almost joking because it's between you and an ex. But this is between me and my daughter who have we have a really great relationship. Right. And and it's still honestly the same thing happened. Yes. And I'm aware that it will be that way soon, too. Right? I mean, she's eight right now, but she's already arguing with me about a bolus or, um, you know, she has her own opinions. And I love that so much. And I really um, try to encourage it. And I'm I'm aware that at some point this will be me, you know, texting her going, um, hey, 
hey, do you see that 50? Is everything good? And then she's going to text back one word, help, and I will have no idea what to do. I oh, sent God. a, um, Arden was on the beach on Friday. So Arden doesn't go to, Arden doesn't have classes on Fridays, and she's close to a beach where she goes to school. I'm not, like, I don't pay attention to what she's doing moment to moment, you know? Um, but I got a, I got mm-hmm. a, I got a signal and I was like, oh, Arden's low. And I looked and it wasn't like, like it was a low that kind of crept up on her. And I looked at her location and she was on a beach and I texted and nobody answered. And I was like, well, I mean, it's loud there. So I sent like a find your iPhone signal to her phone. And right. Oddly, that one, I got back like, hey, I'm okay, Um, blah, blah, blah. This is what I did. I've already treated this. You know, I said, oh, I love you. And she's like, that was nice. Like, she hearted my I love you. Which, by the way, as you get older as a parent, it's interesting where you accept your, like, reassurance from. Like, my wife wife will be like, Cole, put a heart on that. And I'm like, you know, the heart's the first thing you get to with your finger, right? (laughs) Oh, geez. But my wife's like, but it's a heart. I'm like, if the thumbs up was first, you would have got a thumbs up. I'm just saying <laughs> this is about oh, this is about finger travel, not about feelings, but OK. And uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, but so she was OK and her reaction was fine and she was absolutely fine. Like she didn't mind right. that I helped that I was looking out for. Her. And this time, I don't even know that she minds. I think if we got her hold of her right now and asked, she'd be like, look, I was just I was running around getting ready for you know, class and, you know, I know was more typing than stop. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And it's hard to know what that, yeah, what that means to her. If she would have, if she's actually irritated by it or if she was like, yeah, that, that was fine. I just wanted you to know I had it. Yeah. Anyway, let's, yeah. Uh, well, how do we, yeah. how do we manage Ray? Is it uh MDI pumps, CGM? Obviously you have a CGM, but what do you do? Right. Yeah. So she's on a c- control IQ. Okay. Oh, great. Excellent. Mm-hmm. How do you find that? You know, I really like it. I was just talking to somebody um, about this who's kind of considering. I, well, I don't know if she's considering looping. I was considering looping for her. I was <laughs> encouraging her to look into it. <laughs> um, and because she's on the Omnipod. And so she was asking about control IQ. And I, I feel like. What I feel about Control IQ, and this is based on, you know, what I see, frankly, on the on the Facebook page about Omnipod 5, is that Control IQ is an algorithm that helps you avoid lows and kind of get an edge on the creep up, but it um, it doesn't get in your business too much. You can still do extended boluses, you can still jump in, and it feels like Omnipod 5 is kind of designed for, for more more of a hands-off approach. I don't know. I'm just kind of speaking based on what I see from folks. No, I So think- I really like being able to get in there and, and make my own decisions about bonuses and stuff like that. Yeah, I think Omnipod 5 is very specifically designed to be a thing that you don't think about. And, right. you know, and I, I agree that Control IQ has a couple more like options for you on a more like I'm, I was going to say on a manual, but you're not really a manual. You're still in the algorithm, but you can do a little more. And then loop mm-hmm. is loop is probably like the, you know, like the way the nth degree of that idea where you have a lot of, you know, autonomy to make changes as you go. And um, I think they all have their place for sure. And I, I think that if you, if you asked people who are newly diagnosed, they'd say, I want the thing where I don't think. Like, I, I think that it's going that way. Like, I don't think people want Absolutely. to. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And I think it works for different, like you said, it has its place. It works for different people. And I think Control IQ works great for us because we can set profiles, but it's not so manual that we're really fighting over every detail. So I really like that we can kind of use it in our situation. If I, if it was just me caring for her, I would be really interested to try looping. Um, but in my current situation, this works great. Um, I really, I'm really inspired by some of the folks you've had on um, the Lazy IQ, and then Jeremy. But I really just leave it in sleep mode. I override every bolus, and um, that's just how I do it. It makes sense to me. I was really, I think that's why I love the podcast right away because 
in the first episodes I was listening to, you were going, look, I just look at a plate of food and I go, hey, that looks like 25 carbs. I'm going to give five for the broccoli. I'm going to give a couple for the burger. Go. And I was like, whoa, that's perfect. That's how my brain works. I want to be able to just name the units and, you know, think about it that way and not be so um, underwater with them with the math. So I really like being able to uh, yeah, override bolus. I, I stuff. think it, I think that con. I mean, obviously, it's the way I think, so I'm going to agree with it. But I I think I've seen it t- right. touch so many people and have a similar impact yeah. that I really. I mean, and even Arden, like, look, she went away to college and she's maintaining her. I mean, her A1C went up like I don't know, like point two. Like, do you know what I mean? In the first yeah. the first couple months she was there, and then we very recently uh, visited. So her spring break came. So it was the end of our, she, Arden has, is in a system with quarters, not tra- like not semesters. So mm-hmm. the, it was the end of the quarter. We took that opportunity. Arden traveled from where she is to where her brother is. She spent a couple of days with him. Then we showed up and we spent like four or five days together. And then he had to kind of get back to work. So we went back to school with Arden and we got her like, you know, we clean, we helped her clean her dorm room and went shopping for food and stuff like got her set back up for the next quarter. And we were kind of at dinner one night. And I was like, look, you're doing a terrific job, like a really, really, really great job. I'm very proud of Mm -hmm. you. Um, But here are the two things I need you to do that you're not doing right now. (laughs) And and I was like, and they're not big things. I was like, but you're looking at high blood sugars a little too long and you're not pre-bolusing long enough before your meals. Mm -hmm. And she's like, "Okay." I'm like, really are. That's my only feedback. I said, I think you're I think your A1C could go back to under six like in the fives if Mm -hmm. if you just do these two extra things and it's saying a lot because her sleep schedule screwy her eating schedule screwy the food she's getting is terrible from right from the school she actually is in the middle of uh trying to get an um a con what am i i I just said every word except the one i wanted a dorm uh that has Uh has a kitchen in it because she wants to cook more of her own food yeah. She's like, I oh my just gosh. Like, I can't. The college yeah. food. Holy cow. That is impressive to be able to handle that even remotely. Oh my gosh. You have no, I mean, this bolus that we're talking about this morning, by the way, her blood sugar is 107 now for everybody who's concerned. Right. Yeah. I mean, she bolused 65 carbs this morning, mm-hmm. which was almost 13 units of insulin. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, oops, sorry about that. It was, I hate this. By the way, whoever makes Night Scout, I hate that noise. Fix it. Make it go away. Pick a different noise. Anything at all. I mean, she didn't miss by much. Like, the reality of it is, is she probably ate five minutes too late. And if she wouldn't have, this curve that she created would have happened a little sooner. Now, if if this 107 levels out, I don't know how to argue with that. Like, you know, then her her eating, she just she just started a little late. And that, again, is probably because she's rushing around. So, I, I mean, she's 18. You right. Know, you know. It's uh, pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's pretty, I, it's yeah, pretty yeah. And I feel like it, it would be so much easier for it to go the other way where it went too high. And I, I appreciate that perspective. And I definitely keep it in my head when she goes low before breakfast or something like that. Look, it was just a little, the curve was just a little too soon. Yeah. Um, yeah. Stop, fix it or whatever. <laughs> it sounds like what Arden did was she was like, it'll be fine. And uh, (laughs) because she knew that because she knew the food was in, she probably if she responded back would have said, you should have seen what I just the mess that these people just gave me that I just ate. Trust me, it's going to hit my blood sugar in a minute. Right, Uh, right. But anyway, it's, you know, and for people listening who have like a late high school age kid who might be going to college, I have to tell you that I've one child who's gone through college and has graduated already and one child who's a freshman, the food service at the first school was terrible but it was mm-hmm. it was obviously terrible like you looked at it and you're like oh god like i'm so sorry you're going to have to eat this like it, it felt <laughs> it felt like that right like he once sent us a picture of pink chicken oh mom and he's like hey look you know here's a piece of chicken a kid got in the cafeteria the other day the kids blew the school up on um on instagram about it like they went oh, after geez. went after him on social media and the school responded with this like a like a government thing that said that because of the way they cook the chicken it may look pink and that's safe. Oh my gosh. Well, they didn't say 
I get you don't want your chicken to be pink. <laughs> <laughs> or they just went after, that's fine. It's it's safe. Like, blah, blah. <laughs> anyway, Arden gets to school. And we're on the tour, you know, before she chose the school. And the cafeteria that she eats in is magical. Oh, wow. It, you walk in, you're like, oh, my God. Like, I, I, I'd happily live in here. You, you know, like, beautiful <laughs> and, like, food everywhere and blah, blah, blah. But what she ended up telling me after not much time is she's like, Dad, this is all just really processed, crappy food. And, mm-hmm. you know, she's like, even the mm-hmm. vegetables are, like, they're soaked in something that's not really butter. And I don't know what it is. And, you, you know, like, so it's just, it's really impactful. Um, your kids are really going to need to know how to use insulin if they're going to go to college. That's for sure. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just a whole, how do you feed that many kids without getting giant cans of green beans soaked in something, you know, how do you do it? I don't know. (laughs) And that's the other thing is that it's almost like the, the conversation earlier about you need to understand diabetes better, but how's everyone going to do that? Like what's Gordon (laughs) Ramsay going to show up at every school and set it up and, you know, (laughs) They're just, and it sucks because, you know, even she said to me recently, she's like, you know, everybody talks about like, you know, they they still say like, oh, I'm going to put on the freshman 15. And she's like, maybe that wouldn't be necessary if this food was decent. Oh, yeah. I think that's what it is. 100%. It's it's the food. Yeah. Well, that freaked me out because as a person who has put so much effort into like making small changes, you know, for, Mm -hmm. for my kids, like I was like, wait, so. 20 years I've been at this and now I'm powerless. <laughs> you want to hear a funny story, Kristen? Hold on. Sure. So my, my son moves, you know, to take a job and I go with him like, cause he is poor kid. Like he got a job and they were like, you have to be here in two weeks and start. It was in another state, 700 oh, miles wow. from our house. He had never had a job before because he was a college baseball player. So baseball was his job. He's never had a job before. He's moving across the country to take a job. Right. And um, so I'm like, I'll go with you. I'll help you get the apartment set up. Like we had to rent him an apartment sight unseen, which was frightening. Anyway, we're in the grocery store like two days before I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave like the next day. And we're trying. He doesn't know. He's walking around like, I don't know what to buy. You know, like, I don't, you know, (laughs) so I'm like, here, grab some of this. Like, I'm just trying to get him going. And I go to get him some olive oil to cook with. (laughs) And they don't have cold pressed olive oil in the grocery store. Which, for anybody who cares, when you press oil, an olive oil with heat, you change it and you fundamentally make it, it's just not as healthy afterwards, right? And it's a Uh little thing, but it's a thing I figured out years ago, Kristen, and damn it, like removing (laughs) other oils out of the house, like canola and vegetable oil, all that stuff, none of that exists in the house. In my house, there's olive oil that is cold pressed and there's coconut oil to make popcorn in. Like that's all that's in my house, okay? So I'm standing in the grocery store. Oh, my God. All right. I, I'll just tell you. I'm standing in the grocery store. They don't have cold-pressed olive oil. And I start to cry. Oh. I literally, <laughs> like, not like, like you know, like soap opera. <laughs> but I was just, like, tears started coming out of my eyes. And I was, like, so frustrated that, like, I'm like, oh, no. Like, I did all this to put him in this position. And now uh. this so this lady next to me goes, she goes, honey, you okay? <laughs> and I go, yes, thank you. Like, how am I going to explain this to her? Right? I'm going to say they don't have cold fermented olive oil. <laughs> and she's going to call the cops, you know? <laughs> so I just shifted the conversation tiny bit. I said, this is, I'm, I just brought my son to the city. He's staying for a job and I'm, starting to realize I'm leaving. I just lied to her a little bit. Like, this is why I'm crying. Meanwhile, like, you know. Don't you think part of why you were crying is that you were sad to leave your son? Well, yes. Oh, the whole shopping experience was terrible. (laughs) I walked around there with blinders on. I tried not to make eye contact with him because I was like, I was upset. Don't get me wrong. I was on the edge, Kristen. (laughs) I was like... (laughs) But the actual reason that I couldn't hold it together was the freaking olive oil. And, um... And I just told her, you know, I'm just sad about leaving my son. And she goes, oh, sweetheart. She's like, it's the greatest thing. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. She's oh, yeah. <laughs> apparently she didn't Getting like. Getting rid of your kids. Yeah, she didn't, like, she didn't like her kids as much as I like mine. I don't think <laughs> she, she was like, oh, please, oh, you're going to love this. And I don't 
particularly love it, in case you're wondering. But anyway, Aww. my bigger point was, I guess I needed to embarrass myself on the podcast. I haven't done that in a while. Uh, yeah. But yeah. but That's the other thing good. is, just like all this preparation goes into something. And yeah. then suddenly, poof, gone. It's not even up to you. It's over. You know? No, I totally get the freaking olive oil moment because it's it's about like you just like, you know, kill yourself to make things happen for your kids and to get things together for your family. And in the end, you have no control. Mm -hmm. And I think being confronted with that realization is sobering and sometimes makes you tear up in the grocery store. Oh, my God. I'm such a baby, too. I mean, there's no no way around it. Also, I'm calling this episode freaking olive oil. And uh, oh <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so you're using control IQ. Do you think right. there are people listening who are like, he asked about control IQ 10 minutes ago. <laughs> And now yes. we're back to this. <laughs> For sure, yeah. But you're liking that. So you're using a Dexcom G6 if you're using Control IQ, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, do you intend to move to the G7 once it's compatible? Oh, yeah. I'm so excited. I am very much looking forward to the 30-minute warm-up time. That sounds so nice to me. And the, the transmitter thing... Are you still there? Kristen, do you live on the side <laughs> of a mountain by I mean, chance? I I live in a mountainous area. There's not like mountains right next to me. Is it? Is you do. That's okay. But like a, a goat's not no, running on a wheel uh, to make no, your power or something like that. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> you just you just kicked out. I'm sorry, G seven. Oh sizes, yeah. Uh, I'm looking forward to the warm up time being only thirty minutes and the transmitter thing, but I was just asking, you guys are on the G seven, is that right? So Arden just used a G7 for 10 days, and okay. she's going back to use up a couple of G6 sensors. And then I think in about a week, her the rest of her G7s get delivered. For people who are like, I don't understand how that happens. I'm happy to tell you, I got one promotional G7 for Arden to use because of the podcast. And while we were visiting with her, I said, hey, why don't you wear this while I'm here? That way we can learn about it together. Then you can switch back to G6 and then, you know, go back to G7 and you'll have some context for it. So she wore it for 10 days. She'll be wearing it again in like a week or two for the rest of okay. know, going forward. Cool, cool. And and so when you um, put it on. I can't believe you just broke up again, Kristen. That's hilarious. <laughs> Your connection is unstable. I think oh the, no! The I'm so sorry. That's all right. I think the, 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 yeah, the goat just stopped for a second. So when you put okay, it, yeah, I heard okay. you, I heard you say so. When you put it on, oh geez, when you put it on, is there something you have to do with the transmitter, or do you just kind of ignore it and it connects? Okay, so you unscrew the little lid from the the doohickey. <laughs> sorry, you push it against your skin. Uh, it kind of <laughs> collapses. This like there's a ring. Once you unscrew the lid, you'll see this kind of clear ring. And then mm -hmm. you press down, the ring kind of goes up inside of it. So then the, I'm doing a poor job of this, but then the, uh, I get it, I get the it. yeah, the device is now touching your skin. You push a button on the side. I've seen, I've seen it inserted now for a couple of different people about a half dozen times. Nobody seems to notice any pain from it. Cool. Press it down, put the cover on. And then you take your phone, scan the QR code on the side of the, inserting device and mm -hmm. somewhere between like 25 to 30 minutes later it just pops on and it's there oh cool okay and yeah. i was just wondering if there's like you know the the getting the transmitter to connect always feels dicey to me so i was wondering like does this make that go away or does this oh just happen every time now? yeah i mean i've seen four of them so far and so far i haven't noticed the problem with that at all cool okay that's great the one thing i'll bring up is that it doesn't delete the transmitter from your Bluetooth profile and your phone, which I know it can. I know there's no way for it to actually happen, but I don't know if people pay attention to this or not. But every time you put on a G6, you put on and, and with a new transmitter, you're pairing to a new transmitter. You're making a new Bluetooth connection to something. And then your right. your phone holds on to that as something that it's been it's good to delete the old ones is what I'm saying. Okay. And so on G6, you know, a transmitter lasts 90 days, you're really only deleting a few a year. But 
with G7, every 10 days, you're going to, I would go into my Bluetooth and delete the old transmitter, being very careful not to delete the one that you're using currently, obviously. Okay. Well, that is totally, I can do that. That's worth the headache of, it's just, you know, it's like one more thing. Just the other night we had to do a, a Dexcom change. I finally gave up at two in the morning and decided to pull it because it was so bad and then it was dead uh, once I got it. And so just, you know, picture me at two in the morning hunched in the bottom bunk of a bunk bed with a sleeping kid and, you know, test strips trying to pry out the transmitter to get a new one in there. It oh. was a, it's a rough night. So I'm very excited for that just to be one problem instead of two. <laughs> well, just just that it's one thing. Like, it's so cool. Like, you peel it off and you, like, toss it in the trash. You kind of don't even feel bad about it. It's so small. You know, you're like, ooh. Yeah. And <laughs> I asked Arden afterwards. I was like, so G7, what do you think? She goes, smaller. And I was like, cool. Like, that's really what she had to say. She's like, smaller. And so she must have noticed that it was smaller. Yeah. Yeah, that was cool. that was that was kind of it. It's, uh, you know, I've heard people say, like, oh, there's, you know, like, I'm, I'm seeing connection issues with mine and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I, you know, Arden didn't have any of those problems. So I don't know what to say. And the other person that I see using it is not either. Great. And I'm being a little vague just because it's nobody's business. Uh, but <laughs> maybe one day I'll talk about it. Okay. And well, that sounds like a story. Now I'm intrigued. Oh, sure it is. There's always a story, Kristen. There has to be a story. Um, what am I not talking about that you'd be interested in covering? Gosh, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I can talk a little bit about, you know, school stuff. That's kind of interesting. I don't know. I was I was kind of having a little imposter syndrome coming on here. I was like, gosh, what in the world would make this valuable for people to listen to? They've heard all about control IQ and they've heard all about divorce and they've heard all about anxiety and mental health stuff. So I don't know. I don't I'm not um I don't know if I have anything unique to share. <laughs> well, no, I think that the thing like the massive thing that came out of this, I thought, was just the intersection of the conversation about what happens when you know, when race somewhere else and you don't have the autonomy to reach out. And then this thing happened to Arden all at the same time, which was mm -hmm. freaking, freaking weird. <laughs> but I, I thought that was terrific. And I don't think there's anything wrong with reminding people that, you know, you have this kind of hypervigilance that's given to you by the diagnosis. And that yes. it's, it's mm -hmm. really difficult. Like, I, I thought it was very cool the way you talked about aiming it at something else. Yeah. Honestly, I, I I thought that was really valuable because I think what happens to a lot of people is that they just stare at a number on a screen and make themselves, you know, upset looking at diabetes. Yes, which I do, which I do do. I just also do school. <laughs> it's, it's Don't get me wrong, adding. Scott. I do that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's definitely part of the deal. And I wonder if, if um, I imagine that's true for type 1 diabetics as well, that you have a lot of hypervigilance. And in different ways, right? Because it is your body. And I, I was a part for a little while of a, a meditation group that was virtual. And they it was for type 1 diabetics and their caregivers. And that was really cool because it was just kind of acknowledging the relationship you have with your body or with the body of the person that you care for, which is just really strained in some ways um, because of chronic illness in a way that you know, it's not for the typical person with a functioning pancreas trying to meditate, you know. Would you get, like, you got together, like, digitally, like, over Zoom or something, and then... Yeah, over Zoom, and oh. there were some guided meditations. It was so cool. I'm not sure why I stopped doing it, except that, you know, everyone gets Zoom burnout every once in a while, but um, it was very, very helpful to see a particularly a lot of most of the people on it were diabetics themselves, uh, adults, and they're talking about things like how difficult it is to trust your body to be well when it might not be and how you kind of exist in that space of learning to build that trusting relationship. It might sound a little out there for some people, but I thought it was really helpful. No, I don't think so. I also, I think that people do exist in different spaces, right? So You'll see people, like, use Arden as an example. Arden does her thing. The diabetes does what it does. She does what she's supposed to do. Sometimes she's high and she fixes it, and sometimes she's low and she fixes it. But for the most part, you'd be hard-pressed. If, if I pulled Arden aside and said, describe yourself, I don't know that she'd ever mention diabetes. 
Right. That's right. Mm-hmm. And I think there are people who you'd pull aside and say, describe yourself. And they'd say, I have the first thing that would come out of their mouth is I have diabetes. And, right. you know, and then they'd go from there. So does everybody get where Arden is? I kind of think they do eventually. I think that the one thing, this is kind of a big idea from a person who has perspective, because I see a lot of people talking and I see a lot of people living with things at different points in their journey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think eventually, if, if I could somehow make sure that the next 10 people I interviewed had had diabetes for 10 years, but also understood it, you'd hear a lot Mm -hmm. of people talk like Arden. And, you know, and I think if you find a lot of newer diagnosed people um, or people who are not quite in control of their surroundings like you are, they'd sound like you. You, you know. And I think that it's a, it, I'm wondering if that's true. Like, I almost wonder because there's been so much stigma around diabetes, there are folks who've been diagnosed for a long time and they're very kind of loud and proud about it. And I, I do think you're true. If we were to look 10 years in the future, what, what are kids 10 years in the future who are diagnosed now going to be saying about diabetes? And I wonder if it's a lot like garden, you know, these kids are in a different time where there's, it's not this grim diagnosis that it was. It's not, um, people are showing their CGMs. It is just this kind of demarginalizing of, of chronic illness that's happening. And I don't want to say, oh, things are going to be great and easy. I still think you're going to have to advocate, but um, that's got to have an impact. No, for sure. I, I, I believe that totally. And I always try to also think about all the people who are not on social media because that is, right. that is most people. I just, so I just kind of put people in slots. Like I didn't mention all the slots that I think of people. There are also people who've had diabetes for a long time, don't understand it or struggling terribly. And, right. and there are people who have given up. There are people who run high on purpose. There are people who run low on purpose and feed their insulin. Like everybody's doing it slightly differently, which I think, mm-hmm. you, you know, you mentioned earlier, like I do the thing that fits how, how we live and how I do it. So, right. but in the end, my goal is for anybody to have the ac- have access to information that would let them live a stable existence at a blood sugar that's not going to cause them a problem in the future. Yeah, people have a choice, right? And not feeling like they're they're kind of stuck in one way. Sure. I, and I'm curious how Ray is going to go. I mean, for her right now, she's very uh she really likes having diabetes. It makes her feel special. Um I mean, it ends this morning, she just said to me, um, mom, before I had diabetes, my life was kind of boring. I didn't have much going on. And I thought that was so interesting that now she feels kind of like herself, like there's something um, to focus on. I mean, I don't know what that means. It was also, you know, a pandemic. So who knows what kind of yeah. was working out for her mental health wise. That is interesting. Um, like there's something that she... Uh, identity wise like you know like you're yeah. like a little kid and there's just you get up and you do a thing every day and blah 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 and it's just mm-hmm. over and over again but all of a sudden there's a thing about you that's different and instead of like brushing up against it and being like I can't believe this happened to me she's more like huh there's a thing about me that's different that's cool yeah and I I was thinking this the other day too and I don't know how I feel about saying this but I just know that it's true that um if you know, tomorrow we were to wake up and they were to say, Hey, look, there's a cure for type one and it's totally accessible. Here it is. And that were to go away from our lives. You have to feel this way about Arden. I just felt like way that would be pretty jarring. Obviously I'd be happy, but also I'd be really lost for a little bit in my connection to her. Does that make sense? Oh no. Yeah. And you'd have to read, kind of rejigger your focus of your life. I think that's what it really is, is that you've put so much effort into this thing now that Mm -hmm. it takes up time. It is part of your identity, right? Like if I asked you about you, at some point you'd say I'm the mother of, you know, a child who has type one diabetes and, you know, and then all, if that all went away, it would take time to, to, to settle again. And by the way, that's not, I put this, I've put this question online a couple of times over the years Uh, just to kind of give people some comfort. But the amount of adults with type one who say they wouldn't give it away is interesting. Yes, I've noticed that too. I found that so fascinating. I I mean, as a parent, I'd have to say, yes, take it away because, uh, you know, obviously there's just so much risk involved. Um, 
but it is true that it would shake up myself and my life. But I mean, specifically the kind of connection we have, you know, it's funny when she switched to the pump, I had this feeling of kind of loss and despair that was very not connected to like the fact that I was very excited and knew it was the right thing. And I, and I thought I sat with that for a while and I was like, you know, this feeling of loss I'm having is the same feeling I felt when we stopped nursing and she was a baby. Mm -hmm. It's like this connection I had to her and this way I provided for her went away Yeah, and it changed my connection to her. And so it was giving shots, which is like a pretty weird, you know, not super like loving, you know, intimate connection with your child, but it still was in so many ways. And, you know, obviously I still have that connection with her, but just like the, the way I can make eye contact with her across the room and we know we're checking in about blood sugar, you know, Mm -hmm. you know, she plays sports. And if I walk up to the edge of wherever she's playing, she knows to run over and get a snack. Like I value that connection we have And that kind of understanding and the way she knows how proud I am of her for managing or the way she'll tell me, hey, no, mom, I think it should be this many units. Like, that's a whole thing we do. What would it be like to just, you know, Hmm. give her a a meal in the morning and let her go play softball and not really pay attention, you know, um, to what was happening? It would just change us fundamentally. Is the message here that because of diabetes, you focused on your kids in a way that you hadn't prior? 100%. Yeah. Absolutely. And I'm sure it's true with anything. I mean, even if it's just um, your kid takes up a new instrument, you have, you know, and say your kid starts playing the trumpet and they get all this confidence about it and you also played the trumpet. So you talked to them about it. I mean, now that's part of your Mm -hmm. shared experience. And um the way that they have, you know, they feel loved by you. And so I think that's going to be true with a lot of things, but there's something so relentless about diabetes. I mean, it is relentless. There's not something relentless about it. And um, it, yeah, it really changes the way the two of you connect. I mean, with Arden, if you suddenly never had to talk about diabetes with her again, I'm sure it would change the stuff you randomly texted her about, you know, instead of going, Hey, Oh no. <laughs> 53, you know, we're, we're right? definitely, yeah. I mean, it, we're definitely closer because of diabetes. Right. That's for certain. Like it just, it forces you together, you know, like, and yeah. it's not that you don't listen. It's not that you're not interested in your kids, but life gets moving. And sometimes yeah. you just like, Oh, it's on autopilot and it's working. Like I'm going to get through yeah. this week. I'm going to get through work. We all ate, you know, everybody's clean. They went to school, like, you know, and that right. stuff that, that those function things, they just keep happening. And you have a way of like drifting like apart, like during stuff like that. And this is yeah. something that holds you together. Listen, I've said this before, but I once wrote a blog post a long time ago about how lucky I felt because in the middle of the night, I hold Arden's hand and uh-huh. I've watched her hand get bigger and bigger and bigger. And yeah. and no, you don't get that if you don't have to go test your kid's blood sugar in the middle of the night. That's right. It's a bizarre, it's a bizarre kind of extension of babyhood where you're up in the night mm-hmm. um, and you kind of fill that role of the, of just the night watch And it's become really precious to me, too. Um, And it's always that way with kids. You know, there's always something. But this is a particularity of of that relationship that is weirdly meaningful, despite, you know, all the challenges and sometimes the, you know, just general regret of it and wishing it would go away. Yeah, there's just some radical acceptance. I understand. You'd listen. If you if I gave you the magic wand after thinking about it for a long time, you'd be like, yeah, goodbye, diabetes. I'll figure out the rest of it later. But right. yeah, but I understand all the push and pull. Listen, about having something taken from you, this is not in the public, Kristen. So this is just between you and I. But by the time people hear this, it won't matter. It will be out by then. <laughs> I decided uh, to take a GLP-1 for weight loss. So okay. I'm using Wegovy. And okay. um, the details are not important here. But, I mean, your appetite really does – It's I did not have a big appetite to begin with. I'm almost at the point now where I don't think about food at all, like to the point where I'm reminding myself to eat um, Mm -hmm. throughout the day. But I do recognize that in the evenings, like if you sit and watch, like even if it's just like I'm going to make popcorn while we watch this movie or something like that, like you don't realize how much of that 
just the preparation of the food and the talking about it and all that stuff is part of your day. So my wife and I sat down, I don't know, Saturday night to watch television together. Mm -hmm. We work really hard. Like, so during the week, my house just is very still. Nobody uses like TVs or anything. So we're like, we're really going to do this. Like, we're going to stop working. And like, we were all like excited. And then I sat down and she looks over at me. She goes, are you okay? And I'm like, why? Yeah, I'm okay. Why? She goes, you look sad. And I was like, um, I'm, I am. And she goes, why? And I'm like, I, I, I thought to make popcorn and I was like, but I don't want it. Oh no. And it was a really, really interesting moment where I was like, oh my God, how much of my time am I filling with things I don't even want or need because it's the way I do it. Yeah. Does that ritual. Make, yeah. Mm -hmm. Does that it just, just absolutely ritualistic. And, um, and so I'm like, I'm not sad, like, I'm, um, but, but I feel empty and she's, yeah. and that, that is, I sat there for like two hours enjoying what we were doing together, enjoying the thing I was watching. And I still had this feeling of emptiness inside. And I thought, oh my God, like, I'm like so fundamentally broken about like, <laughs> about food. Like, thank God for this, this, this injection. <laughs> like, like, really, like, I never would have, like, known this because I'm not a big eater. Like, I joke, yeah. I joke all the time. Listen, it, it, this is just, this, these are the words I use in my private life. I'm like, I am the fattest person you'll ever meet that doesn't eat. Like, I just, <laughs> I don't take in a bunch of food. My body shouldn't, like, based on what I take in, I shouldn't be this size. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't want you to give the the impression that I'm, like, you know, but I am like, I, I obviously my doctor wrote me a prescription for something and the insurance company said yes to it because my BMI is high enough that I, I mm -hmm. fit, I fit this need. Right. But in a, in that doctor's office a couple of weeks ago, I said to the doctor before we start, because I think you need the context for why I'm asking about this. How much do you think I weigh? And I mm -hmm. said, please, you, know, like, you can't hurt my feelings. I have a very close relationship with this physician. You know, it's almost like friends sitting together. They're, they're not going to like, I, I stood up, I took my sweatshirt off, I spun in a circle and she goes, uh, I, I got you at 175 pounds. And I was like, wow. yeah. And I said, yeah, I think that's part of the problem. And she goes, what? I said, I weigh 233 pounds. Mm -hmm. And she goes, what do you mean you think that's part of the problem? And I said, I look in the mirror and I don't look mm -hmm. at a person who looks like they need to lose weight. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know how I'm carrying it. Like, it's like, I'm broad shouldered, Kristen, you know what I mean? Uh -huh. So like, I just kind of like, I don't know, like, it's, it's, it's the way you hear people say, like, I just carry it differently. And right, but it right. doesn't mean I'm not going to have a freaking heart attack 10 years from now from it. And so like, I'm like, I can't like, I've done this, I've done this. I'm like, my body's breaking down. I'm like, my knee is messed up. I can't ride the bike I used to ride. Like, I can't, I'm like, I need help or I'm going to, I'm going to have a health issue. And I, I don't want that. And and she was like, yeah, let's like, you know, she gave me a full physical and everything. And then we started doing it for context. In the first five days, I lost six and a half pounds. Oh, you know, I think I think one thing you're bringing up is really interesting, which is that we do have a lot of our food and our emotions are so in, interconnected, which takes us back to diabetes, too. But I do think that sometimes when we I mean, this is. The idea, right, in all these um, religious um, groups where there's like fasting, that when you take away a food ritual, like your popcorn at night, suddenly you have feelings there and you're like, oh, wow, look at this. This is super interesting. This feeling was probably there before, but then there was also food. And there's actually help deal with trauma. I mean, this is real. You can't make this stuff up. Um, and I was like, oh, that's why I used to get hamburgers all the time when I was going through my divorce. How fascinating. Yeah. But, um, you know, when you take away that food, then there's all this stuff there for you to kind of focus on. And uh, what do you do with that? And yeah. how does that impact your relationship to all those things? I realized I could have busied myself with anything sitting there. Right. Like if I would have mm -hmm. taken two sticks and tapped them together and focused on doing it, it would have been the same as eating the popcorn. And it's not yeah. that I, and it's, but, and what I, it's not that I don't like the popcorn, but what I realized is I would have made a bowl of popcorn and then eaten half of the bowl, <laughs> right? I would have been just as happy with a, a handful of popcorn 
And, yeah. you know, as far as the popcorn part goes, so for the, there is value in the food part of it, but then there's the right. rest of it, which has nothing to do with the popcorn and the popcorn's masking it. And I was like, yeah. huh. And, mm-hmm. and the one thing I'm proud of is that in that moment, I was like, oh, I'm doubling down on, on what I'm doing, not going the other way. Cause I easily could yeah. have been like, I don't want to feel like this. I'll eat, the right. po- I'll stop t- doing this and eat the popcorn. But instead I was like, no, no, no. I'm like, let this whatever that magic juice is in that pen, like let that help me until I can kind of rewire my brain around this. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And just, it'll be such a fun adventure to see what interesting emotions pop up yeah. and, and what's kind of there for you to sift through. Um, yeah. I really agree because yeah, yeah, I don't, yeah. I've said on the podcast before, like I don't think of myself as my physical form. Like, I don't know that you said that you said something earlier. You're like, that might sound weird to people. Like, I like if you asked me to describe myself, I would never describe my height, my weight, my like nothing. I don't I think of myself as my thoughts. So mm-hmm. the only reason I had to want to address this is I just want to keep being alive and thinking. And so right. <laughs> ser- seriously, so like I. It's not like I want to have abs or I care what people think when they look at me. I'm not self-conscious in public, like nothing like that. And I also don't want to give the idea that I'm, you know, uh, in some serious situation that other people might be in because I'm I'm certainly not. Right. I'm carrying probably, but I mean, 50 pounds to get me to 175. I don't mm-hmm. think I don't think I want to be 175. But I would be at 190, I'd have a much healthier lifestyle because I am carrying enough fat that you can't see it. And it's that much weight. So maybe my knee will stop hurting and I can actually ride my bike again. And maybe like, you know, maybe I won't be eating to fill like time because that really is what it was in the end. It's like boredom. And, yeah. you know, anyway. Well, that's interesting what you say about you really think of yourself as your thoughts. You have picked the right career because (laughs) as a podcaster, you kind of are this, um, you're leaning into your thoughts. Everybody kind of knows you as your thoughts. Such a great way to be actualized and affirmed as you really see yourself. I'm a disembodied voice, Karen. Or Kristen. (laughs) Yeah, it's just me. I'm just like, I'm here in your your head. But for me, it's about talking. Like, I don't even think without the podcast that I would have understood the popcorn moment. Because I, oh, really? get, yeah, because I've had to talk to so many people and pick through their feelings. Like, I know it feels, it can feel like I know something you don't know when you're listening, but you shouldn't mm-hmm. think of me that way. You should think of me as like a person who's like, huh, I don't understand any of this. And I'm just asking the questions that I think get me to understand it better. Right, but, you know? right. So you've like done all the work with all these folks. So now you can offer that to yourself exactly yeah this po- this podcast acts as talk therapy for me but we don't really ever talk about me that much although i'm sure some people think all i do is talk about myself but whatever that's fine <laughs> i saw i saw your review go to hell um <laughs> <laughs> oh that's funny <laughs> oh gosh all right is there anything we haven't talked about that we should have uh no i think we've we've hit it all thank you i really appreciate you doing this um i hope the goat is okay um yeah i'm gonna go Check on her. Yeah, you're going to absolutely, when you listen back to this, you're going to be like, wow, I broke up more than I thought I did. Because there's times where oh, I, God. I let you Yeah, get. my internet, it can be like this. I'm so sorry. Don't worry. I mean, maybe you should tighten the rubber bands or however it works. And <laughs> I like that you're like, I'm in a city, but a mountain. So Denver. Yeah. <laughs> oh, goodness. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Hold on one second for me. I want to thank Kristen for coming on the show and sharing her story. I think I've decided to call this episode Kick the Goat. Uh, What else do I want to remind you of? The Diabetes Pro Tip series has been remastered. It sounds amazing, and it runs between episode 1000 and 1026. It's my humble opinion that if you listen to that series, you'll be able to maintain an A1C in the low sixes with very little trouble. Diabetesprotip.com and juiceboxpodcast.com is where you can find the series online. But listening in an audio player is probably much easier. Episode 1000 to 1026. Thank you so much for listening. I'll be back very soon with another episode of the Juice Box Podcast. A huge thank you to one of today's sponsors, BetterHelp. You can get 10% off your first month of therapy with my link, BetterHelp. 
betterhelp.com forward slash juice box. That's betterhelp.com forward slash juice box. If you've been thinking about speaking with someone, this is a great way to do it on your terms. Betterhelp.com forward slash juice box. 